title of this message is, con- uh, is called To Those Who Believe. To Those Who Believe. The subject of this is, uh, the, su- uh, the subject content of it is, ba- is this, the power in who you are. The key verse of this message is going to be Romans chapter 1, verse 16. But before we go into that, let's pray. Father God, we come before you, Lord, and we thank you. I thank you. I ask, Lord, that you would uh, just have your way in this sanctuary, that you would move and that uh, your spirit would have its, uh, would fulfill its course. In Jesus' name, amen. So Romans chapter 1, verse 16 is a fairly uh, popular verse. And that verse goes on and it says this, Romans 1, 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to those who believe. Amen? For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to save those who believe. And I want to break this, this uh, scripture down, uh, and we're going to go through this. First uh, part of it, it says I. Now, there's one thing about um, I statements, and I, I, the Lord says if, if you're going to boast, boast in the Lord. Amen? We get to boast in the Lord. I am not ashamed of the gospel. Um, I'm a fool for Christ. Amen? And the question could be said, whose fool are you? Right? I would rather be a fool for Christ than the devil's fool. I think that I've been a, a fool for the devil for long enough, but Jesus, on the other hand, he, he, he's, he's much better, amen, to be a fool for. And so one of the things that, um, that I've been enjoying, and I, I've been doing this, uh, I've done it more on the coast than uh, here, but we've been doing this probably about every once a month or so, and we get out there on the street corner, and you may have seen us, and we have a blow horn, and we have these big old colorful sh- uh, shields that have statements on it that says either uh, God is good or praise the Lord or, or something of that sort. But one of the statements that I like to say when I'm out there is this, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to save those who believe. And the reason why is because I've seen the fact that the gospel has the power of the gospel, the power of Jesus has saved me. I can say that that's something I can boast in the Lord, that he saved me because of the power of, the, of God. Amen? And, and, and I, I know that some of us are in here, we can attest to that truth too, and if there's some that don't, I, I, I just, uh, just want to challenge you to stick with it because the scripture says, uh, Jesus says this, he says, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples indeed. And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. So we're going to go on to this one part, and it says, not ashamed. Well, first off, I, I want to say I'm not ashamed to stand up here. I, I believe that this is of God, that God put me here to minister a message to you. I believe that. I believe that God put me right here, and this is not a coincidence, and I believe that it's not a coincidence that you were here. I believe it's a god sentence. I believe that God does these things. And I stand up here as a representative of Jesus Christ, standing right here, believing that God is going to download some things as I minister this message to feed you. I believe that. Not ashamed. I'm not ashamed. Matthew 10, uh, verse 33, I'm going to go there. uh, And it says this. And I think that, you know, there's so many, uh, there's so much fear out there. I, I believe that sometimes you... And, uh, I just feel like the conditioning, There's a, the world conditions fear. I believe that. The world's ways conditions fear. I believe that when we're looking at CNN, we're seeing the news and stuff like that, what we're seeing is this. We're seeing a, a uh, like a, you ever see that movie where, uh, where here's uh, the Batman movie and it's like the Riddler, he's got this thing and it's hypnotizing people? Well, I believe that that's what CNN, and, and, and I'm not saying it's all bad, but I am saying this, that the world's ways conditions people to live in fear. And fear paralyzes you. So Matthew uh, chapter 10, verse 33, it says this. 
But whoever shall deny me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Amen? That's what it says. And I don't want to, I want to stand in, 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 uh, and proclaim Jesus uh, in boldness, in confidence. Do, do you? Amen? Because he's, he saved me, he saved my life. The devil would have you shut your mouth. I could see this firsthand. I, I, I recall this in my life before when I was um, in bondage and in prison. Uh, and I remember being an outward spoken person of the faith. I, I did not care. You know, I was zealous, zealous for Jesus because I knew that he was real. I experienced, I encountered his power, and I knew that it was real. And so in prison, and, and when you're in prison, um, it, there's like a spirit of intimidation everywhere when it comes to Christians. It's not an easy thing to be a Christian in a prison because when you look at a Christian in prison, oh, he's weak. That guy is weak. He, he, he's running to something. He's not, uh, he's not, he's not cool. He, he, does, he doesn't want to fight nobody. He wants to, you know, sit. He's, he's somebody that's over here on the sideline. Uh, you know, and so we don't want to hang out with Christians because, uh, well, just because they're cowards, right? That's, that, that may be the way that a lot of people think. And so, anyhow, when, I'm, when I was in prison, I remember, remember one specific time when um, I'm sitting in the line and, 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 you know, everybody had a job. Uh, most people had a job. And I remember I'm standing there. I used to witness to this guy and talk to him about Jesus. But somewhere down the road, he began to start to hate me. And I didn't do anything out of arrogance or, or ignorance or try to push it on him. That wasn't my, my motive. My motive was to reveal truth. I was telling him valid things that God had did in my life. I wasn't being arrogant about it, and I wasn't pushing it on him. But he began to start to hate me, and he started saying his belief is in, is in his family, et cetera, et cetera. And I recall standing in the, uh, in the chow hall, and I'm sitting there, and, and every person that was a Christian that was walking through the line because I wanted to encourage them and say, hey, man, Jesus, hey, God bless you. Jesus loves you. I want to get them to be a little outward spoken too. And as they would come along, I'd say, hey, God bless you. But the guy that started to dislike me was on my side, the guy that, and he would be handing out the milk. I remember, I think I was handing out green beans or something. I can't remember. But anyways, he would, he, every time I said, praise the Lord, uh, God bless you, brother. Hope you're having a good day. He would say, hell, hey, hell, Satan. Hail Satan. And everybody that he would come through was like, hail Satan. Now in my flesh, being uh, in the way that I used to be in my life, uh, in being a ghetto celebrity, being a dope dealer and selling drugs, uh, wanted to do something different. I wanted to, you know, maybe go ahead and give him one of these or something. But I didn't want to do, I wanted to make sure that, that I had a good testimony for Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm, he says, turn the cheek, Right? And I didn't want to shut my mouth. I, I was not going to shut my mouth, not because I was being arrogant, but because I'm not going to let the devil that's behind him win, right? And that's what God wants. God wants the, 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 men, the men and the women of God to stand up and, and say, you know what? The righteous are as bold as a lion. The wicked, the, the, when trouble pursues, uh, what was the scripture says, the, uh, the wicked flee. When trouble pursues, the wicked flee, but the, uh, flee, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. And, and you guess what? You have Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is known as the Lion of the tribe of Judah. And guess what? He lives inside you. Therefore, there's a lion in you that's bold. Amen? Okay. So, um, one of the other things, one of the, one of the uh, uh, I, I did a study on baptism, and uh, one of the specific things that I studied about baptism was this, that, I mean, there's a whole bunch of different purposes and reasons behind baptism, but one of them that I thought was good was uh, it was used, it wasn't just Jesus and his disciples, there were others that were uh, doing baptisms too, and what it represented was an identification of being, it's a public declaration of identifying to the public who you belong to, and baptism says, I'm going to publicly declare that this is where I identify myself with, I identify myself with Jesus Christ, amen? Amen. That's a, good, that's a good point, because God wants us to not be uh, ashamed. He wants us to proclaim. I love the Lord. He's done so many things for me. And uh, 
I couldn't even, I can't, I mean, there's just so much stuff the Lord has done for me. I'm going to get into this here in a second, but um, when the devil wants to shut your mouth, what, in, as a Christian stands up for truth and stands up for Jesus Christ, you can look at this example with Stephen, right? Stephen, uh, as we know, it was a man full of faith, started out as a deacon in the church, uh, and decided to do, you know, to, um, to serve the widows and be somebody of service, right? That's how he started out as. And then he moved into uh, being more used in ministry. And anyhow, here he is. He's facing, uh, he's facing some persecutors, right? The, the, the Pharisees, uh, the Sadducees, the, Sadducees, the Pharisees. And, and basically, he, he gives a long spill, Holy Ghost-filled uh, message, and the scripture says that he was that those who were listening to him were cut to the heart, and they shut their ears, shut their ears, and they ran toward him because they wanted to kill him. Right? Well, Saul, the apostle Paul, uh, but he was named Saul at the time, was over on the sidelines and uh, witnessing and approving of what they were doing. And so they stoned Stephen to uh, stone Stephen, right? And he di- he got he died, but he also he says, "Look, the Lord uh, is up there and." Uh, and here he is, and he's like, welcome me. And actually, he's standing, right? It's a standing ovation. Good job, Stephen. Now you're going to come to glory with me. But here's the point. The devil tried to shut his mouth, but the Scripture says what had happened on the outcome of Stephen's death is there was a dispersion that took place, and the dispersion was this. All the, all the uh, disciples that were around the circumstance and situation, what had happened is they went off, and they started proclaiming more about Jesus. Right? Even though Stephen died, the, pro- the gospel grew even more due to the death of Stephen. That's what, so when you stand up and you start proclaiming uh, Jesus and, and proclaiming what he's done for you, you can guarantee God is going to confirm his message. And, uh, and it's gonna, you know, it may very well have some damage for the kingdom of darkness. That's what God wants to do. We've been called to, to destroy the works of the darkness because that's what Jesus does. Amen? And he's in you. We'll talk about, I just want to throw this in here about shame. Shame. I, I believe that shame uh, is just a, is, is actually an extra, why well, did I just say it this way, condemnation. The word condemnation, uh, actually in, the, uh, in Romans 8, 1, it says, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, right? Well, the word condemnation, actually it means an adverse sentence, Right? There's a, it's a, there's a sentence going on. There's an accusation. There's, there's accusations coming at you, and you feel condemned, right? And I, I think that we could summarize condemnation in three things. I think it can be shame, it can be guilt, and rejection all in one. You've got shame, you've got guilt, and you've got rejection. And you're condemned. You've got all these voices, right? I, I, I can say this for a fact. There's been accusations all my life, uh, you, you know, of the devil saying, you're not good enough, you're a failure, you're a phony, you're no good, you're not going to amount to anything, uh, look what you've done. Uh, that's what he's done consistently all my life, and one of the things that I've come to, uh, come to the knowledge of is this, that therefore there is now no condemna- condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, amen? Therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Therefore there is now no uh, accusation against me because I'm in Christ Jesus. Why? Because Jesus Christ took the penalty for those accusations. He took, the, he took the penalty for those sins, right? The gospel is a legal document, right? The gospel is a legal document. I was thinking about this. So if you're at your house and all of a sudden the devil, and you're, you're a born-again believer, you're a G, you are a Holy Ghost filled up you know, man of God that, or a woman of God that's just dedicated and committed to God, and then all of a sudden the knock is on the door, and here comes the devil, and he says, I, uh, I come to uh, bring you back into uh, bondage because uh, uh, you're a phony and you're a fake, and I, all your sins of your past. And so I'm bringing these accusations against you because, you know, that's what you are, and so I'm just going to go ahead and bring you back in bondage. You know what you do? You show them your legal documents, yeah. right? Show them your legal documents. And this is, this is my legal document. No, I, I, I've been paid. My, my, my sins have been paid for. My debt is paid in full. Amen? Jesus, when you, when you think of condemnation and you think of shame, guilt, and rejection, Jesus, you see, all, you see ty- in typology all three of them. You see him shamed, right? He was put on the cross naked. That's pretty shameful. 
uh, back in those days, it was pretty glorious to have a good beard. They plucked it out. You know, what else did they do? He, they put a, a thorny crown on his head. They spit on him. They mocked him. That's pretty shameful. Huh? So he was shamed. Okay? Uh, was he, uh, was he, uh, but we get his glory, right? The opposite of shame is glory. We have, so he was shamed. We get his glory. And then you have uh, uh, reject, rejection, right? Was he rejected? When you think about uh, here he is and he's standing before the people and here's the Jews and there's and Pilate's over here and, and, and Pilate's saying, well, who, who, who do you want? Do you want Barnabas, uh, this guy that uh, was righteous, murdered somebody and was, and was a robber? Do you want him or do you want this Jesus that I find no fault in? And they said, well, we want Barabbas. So he was rejected. They took somebody else. Well, he was rejected for us. That we, would, that we might be accepted in the beloved. That's what the scripture says. So we were not only shamed to get, uh, he was shamed so we could have his glory. And not only was he uh, rejected that we would be accepted in the beloved, but also we also have this last one, and that is guilt, right? Guilt. We feel guilt. We get guilt, you know, sometimes. But when you focus on Jesus, he paid the price. But guilt. You feel guilty. I, I've done wrong. This accusation. You should be guilty. You should be guilty for all these sins you've done. You should be guilty. But Jesus paid the penalty. Amen? He was guilty that we would be forgiven. As a matter of fact, um, God, okay, so God put Jesus on the cross, right? And he was, he was rejected by the people. He was shamed by, uh, by um because of his nakedness, he was shamed for our glory, so we would have glory. And then the last thing is um, he was guilty, right? One of the things, what, what, what I really think is interesting is uh, Jesus died. I believe this. I believe that Jesus actually died not because of a physical situation, because the, cross, the people on the cross, they, they were able to live longer uh, than the, that amount of time that Jesus was on the cross. But when Jesus was on the cross, he says this statement. He says, God, uh, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? At that moment. That's when God had rejected him because all the sins had been placed on him. And I believe, and then that right there at that moment, the scripture says he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. He died from a broken heart. He died from being rejected. I believe that. And he died so that we would be accepted. I look at this verse in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 4 through 6. I've said it many times. It goes on this and says this. Um, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ, right? When you have these strongholds, you have these accusations, you have all these things that are trying to attack you and tell you you're not good enough, you're a failure, et cetera, et cetera. The obedience of Christ, I believe, is this, that you're, I'm accepted. Uh, I, I can trust you. Um, God says that you're, you're, you're blubbed, and, and you're powerful, and I'm in you, and you can do wonderful and powerful things if you'll trust me. I believe that you could define that in that, in, in, in that context, in a sense. And so, anyhow, um, so one of the other things is, is I, I, I think of this sometimes, and I like this because I see people, when we're out there, we're evangelizing, when we're doing things and we're, you know, we're going about evangelizing, talking to people, or you're just passing by and you're driving down the road. There's so many people that are hurting, so many people that are broken, so many people that are beat down and, 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 and walking about with their heads down, right? And when their heads are down, I believe that the condemnation and the sentencing, the adverse sentence, right, that's a sentence. God is always a sentence, you know, accusing you. And as you're just sitting down there and you're looking at them looking down and they have no hope, right? But when you focus on Jesus, when you focus on Jesus, guess what? what? You have hope and your head is up, right? I like that. So we talked about not being, uh, I am not ashamed of the gospel for it is the power of God to save. I want to talk about it is the power of God to save. Now, I'm going to look at uh, some of the things that Paul had said. Uh, and, I, you know, we're f- looking at the, you know, the word grace. Anybody know what grace means? Some of the grace means like it's like a merited favor, you know. You know, I love you unconditionally. That's one of the 
one of the definitions. But the other word for grace is uh, power and ability to do the will of God, right? And I look at Paul's writings, and he goes on, and he says, he starts to describe all his hardships, right? He describes, I went through all this, tr- this trouble, all these struggles, all the stuff, because I, I, five times I, I received uh, lashes from the Pharisees and, and the, you know, the religious leaders. And, and he goes, I went through hardship, I went through shipwrecks, I went through all this persecution. And then I, th- and I think to myself, and then he probably thought to himself and said, but all along the way, I didn't think I'd get through it. I wasn't sure what was going to happen. But now that I'm looking back and reflecting on the circumstance, God's grace was all, the way, all there all along the way, right? God gave him the power and the ability to do what he, what he couldn't do in his own strength. And so I'm going to share a couple of uh, things that I have went through in my own life. And well, for one, uh, I was nuts, right? I was nuts. I was in a rubber room, you know, uh, and they considered me somebody that would never get sane, and they used to monitor me uh, on the uh, monitoring system in Walla Walla State Prison uh, on the third floor in the mental illness or the mental hospital. I like to throw that right out there because it's the truth. I was nuts. (laughs) I was insane. But the Lord delivered me. The Lord delivered me. I, I don't, that's one of the things I like to say when I'm on the street corner with a blowhorn. I was nuts. I was a nutcase. But guess what? Jesus saved my soul. He made me sane. That's the good stuff right there. But in that time, when I remember, I just remember, I, 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 it's, I, it's kind of like the Lord must have kind of like hid, kind of blocked some of those memories of that, of that time in my life, which was about 15 years ago. But I just remember just thinking how, I, I remember having panic attacks, and I was, I just remember just, ooh, how am I, like my, you know, your, your soul is your, your mind, your will, and your emotions, and, and you know, you have these thinking errors when you're unregenerated, when you're, when you're a lost soul. And I remember just my emotions were so messed up. I remember hearing an accusation. I didn't, knew, didn't really know what to do with it. You know, you're a failure. You're, 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 you're no good. And then with that would come an emotion that was attached to the thought. And, and then there was also an action that, was, you know, that came out of that too, which was like worry or, or you know, and that, you know all just, or I need more medication. Or something like that. Those were, you know, those are the type of things that, that I had consistently going on in my head and in my mind for quite a while. And I remember having these. Gu- I remember you ever get one of those things where your your gut is it's like cringles up from worry. I had that for days. I remember just, you know, it would never leave, and just worried and, and just panic attacks and sleepless nights and just a, a mess. But the Lord delivered me, and um, I just thank the Lord that he gives us the power of God, amen? Because it says in this uh, section of scripture, it says, but it is the power of God to save, right? I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it, to those, for it is the power of God to save those who believe. It is the power of God to save, the power of God to save, I, man. Those that day, man, September 17, 2008, in prison, calling out to God. God shows up miraculously, just regenes my mind. My complete thinking transformed. I'm no longer thinking those condemning thoughts. No longer am I thinking uh, uh, fearful. I, I have power. I, I have strength. It's just complete change. And God will do that. He's amazing, and, he, and he'll do that. He did that with me. And... Um, but I, that's another whole story, and I wouldn't want to get on that. But um, all I can say is it's powerful. When you serve God and God gives you power, man, it's, it's amazing. There's no higher than the most high, man. I look at this, uh, I, I, I look at what the grace that God carried me through. And I remember one specific test, um, because God, he, he'll gives, he, he gives you power uh, to get through tests. He gives you grace to get through tests. And I, there's, I mean, there's, God had to be in this test. 
I remember, you know, I'm going to go into my uh, divorce that I had went through. Uh, horrible situation. Uh, but God got me through it. But, and so here I am, and uh, I had a situation occur where I had to uh, go and uh, go to court. Uh, uh, actually, I was in a discipleship on, uh, on the coast at the time, and I wasn't, you know, I wasn't ready to leave, or I, at least I didn't think I was. And I was heavily involved in ministry on the coast. Uh, it was my life. And, uh, and then it, there became an integrity issue. And this integrity issue was the fact that my um, ex-wife had, uh, was doing drugs and it was on camera. Uh, and so I knew that I had to do something about it. And so I had to go to the courts and uh, they said, well, you can't live there if you're going to fight for your kids. And so I said, okay, well, I got to do it. And so I, I moved out, and then the battle began. And at the time, just everything started, just everything came into place. I got this <laughs> job that paid $40, $40 an hour, making 7000 a month, uh, doing high rises, and wasn't even really equipped to do it. Uh, and so anyways, here I am, and I'm in this huge test in this battle, and I'm fighting for custody of my kids. And uh, lawyer, I went and got a Christian lawyer, and, and anyways, uh, Five thousand dollars. I need five thousand dollars for you to, for me to even put everything together. And so I go through this. So I give him five thousand dollars, and here I am. I'm going through this 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 fight for the custody of my kids. I got the custody. I got my kids at the time because obviously you know things weren't right. And, but uh, but all along this, there's all these things. This everything. I'm stripped away from all my ministry uh, that I was involved in. I'm paying thousands of dollars to fight for the custody of my kids. I have to have a house uh, to uh, house my kids, uh, so I'm trying to buy, uh, 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 pay for a house, so I do, but I can't live in it because i got to get approval from the courts. I'm, li- I'm driving uh, 70 miles, I think it was, uh, to work, which I had to bring my kids from my parents in Lakewood all the way down to Des Moines to bring them to school because I wanted to have them at the school that uh, they were going to be close to the house that I was going to live at. And... So I'm working long hours. Uh, I'm on like the 13th, I remember, it's the 13th floor of the high rise. It's snowy, uh, thousands of dollars. I'm busting my tail to make this money to feed, to give this lawyer the money to fight for my case. And the whole time, my ex is still doing drugs. And, and I mean, and it's, the truth is, over there, it's like this. Um, and my lawyer told me this. He said, it's a gender issue. You know, you're fighting for custody of your kids. Most of the time, the women win. And here I am. I was in prison for seven years. My kids have been with their mother for the last seven years. And here I am fighting for custody of the kids. And the odds are, well, I'm certain we're probably not going to give them to you. We're going to give them to the mom. We're hoping for her to get better. And I, I wanted her to get better, too. I was fighting for the better stuff. You know, I wanted the good stuff. You know, and so, anyways, um, at the, uh, so, and then I'm, I remember I'm just, and then I'm working for these guys, and I'm the lead of this job because everybody's falling off. I don't even know how to do the job, and and I got these old guys that do know how the job, do know how to do the job, but they don't know how to do the job because uh, I've been on the job since the beginning, and there's certain things they don't understand, but they do understand the other things, and they're mad at me because I'm telling them what to do. Then I get home, and I'm, and I'm driving in just rush hour traffic because on the coast, the traffic is bad. And I'm watching VeggieTales with my kids because I'm trying to change, I'm trying to change, train them up in the ways of the Lord as I'm driving home the 70-mile drive, right? Then when I get home, it's time to do homework uh, with the kids to try to get it situated so they get, you know, good grades because, you know, that's what Christian dads do, right? And so... And all this stuff, all, all just, just the pressure and the pressure and the pressure. You know what? But God gave me the grace to get through it. But I can remember, you should just have a beer. <laughs> Drink a beer. You know, you'll take all your pain away. And, you know, my dad was there when I got home because I had to live there, and he had his beer. And he's like, you can have a beer. No, I'm not going to have a beer. Because if I drink a beer, it's going to be over for me. And so uh, I'm just going to trust God, and God's going to get me through this, and God did.
God gives the uh, gives us power uh, in uh, where the natural man couldn't do. The carnal man wouldn't be able to do it. The natural man could not do that. But when you get filled with grace, the power of God, guess what? You're able to do things that are supernatural. Amen. So we're going to go on to this last point. I got five minutes left, and it, and and now we're going to go to this last part. Uh, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to save those who what? Believe. believe. To those who believe. And as I said it before, I said uh, that the scripture says, if you are my disciples, you shall know that, uh, or Jesus said, if you are my disciples, you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you what? Free, right? He wants you to have freedom. And so Jesus states, and now this I thought was really powerful. I believe this to be a very valid truth, and I believe that one of the, the greatest works of the Holy Spirit, I believe, is to lead and guide you into knowing who you are. I believe that that's what God wants to develop in you, is for you to know who you are, because uh, uh, when you know who you are, you're powerful. You're powerful. I thought this was good. The Lord kind of downloaded this in me a couple days ago, and here's Jesus, all the chief priests, uh, and, and, you know, they're coming to get him, the, so, the Roman soldiers, the mob, and they said, uh, uh, we're looking for Jesus. And Jesus goes on and says, I am he. And at that moment, and this is in the book of John, at the moment that he said, I am he, they fell over, right? And then they got back up. Well, I think that the reason why they fell over is because of the fact that Jesus knew who he was, and there's power when you know who you are. Amen? And so... When you know who you are, you're dangerous. I believe that um, this is a good statement, and this is something that Mark Batterson says, and he says, uh, Jesus, uh, he, he didn't die just to make us safe. You know, he did. he did. He died to make us safe, yes, but he also died to make us dangerous. Amen? He died to make us dangerous. For we are not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God to save those who believe. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Why? Because God saved me. He gave me power. He gave me grace to go through things go through things the natural man would not have been able to do. But he gave me the ability to do some, to do some supernatural things. And I praise the Lord. Uh, and so here we go, and it says right here, I want to just say this real quick. Um, as Jesus was, so are we. I believe that Jesus, here's, here's God in the flesh, in a Jewish Hebrew body, walking about, healing people, casting out demons, casting out, uh, healing, you know, doing all kinds of stuff. I believe this, and I believe this to be true, and, and I, I'm convinced. I, I just know that this is true, that as he was, so are we. We could go up to somebody that has a disease, right, and put our hands on them and be unctioned by the Holy Spirit and cast, uh, and, and, and God will heal them, not because of you, but because of him. And you can do that. As Jesus was, so are you. As you're walking down the street, and, and you see somebody in bondage, and they got an evil spirit, or they got uh, uh, something that's not right, you could go up to them, and, and when you know who you are, and it's of the Lord's will, and you do it, and you do it, God will do it. He'll, he'll heal them. I believe that. And so I've been studying a couple of things, and one of the things I've, uh, I've been thinking about is a couple of people, uh, and that is two people that were persistent in their ministry, and they didn't give up. And, you know, sometimes things just, you know, don't work out. But that doesn't mean we quit, right? We keep going. And one of them is, is, a, is a, a man that we're going to be studying up in our small group anyhow. His name is Dutch Sheets, and he, you know, he believed. He believed that if he prayed for people that they'd get healed. Well, he didn't quit. And uh, one time he, he decided he went to this village, I think it was, and as he's ministering there, uh, he puts his hands on somebody, and, and all of a sudden the lady starts screaming, I'm healed, I'm healed. And, she, and he goes on and he says, he says, well, I didn't think it would actually work, right? <laughs> but he was persistent. Another person that, that I uh, think highly of, and that's a lady named Heidi Baker. She goes into Africa. She doesn't, uh, you know, failure, failure. Doesn't, nothing works. No churches, no nothing, nothing established. But she doesn't give up. She's persistent. She doesn't quit. And then all of a sudden, explosion. 10,000 churches. I mean, that's pretty big, right? I think it's 10,000 churches. And so I just want to encourage you tonight not to give up. Believe who you are. Um, the value of Jesus' blood that purchases the believer. 
you know, that's some blood money you can't buy. Amen? There's so, there, you cannot buy that, that blood. There's no cost. There's no value you can place on that blood. It was perfect. And I just want to say this last statement. He believes in us, right? He believes in us so much that he invested his son, right? Therefore, we ought to believe him. Can we stand? So, Father God, we thank you, Lord, that, uh, that you're awesome. And we, uh, we give you all the honor, the glory, and the praise. And uh, we ask, Lord, that you bless us as we part. And uh, we love you. We thank you. We honor you. We praise you. Uh, in Jesus' name, if anybody wants to come up here and give their lives over to the Lord, this is the time. Praise the Lord. You're dismissed. Thank you.